Hi everybody. Two weeks back, I had gone to assist Nikhil Kamal with his research on his podcast on the electric vehicle revolution. And because of that, we ended up reading 500 pages of research, and we found something absolutely fascinating. The electric revolution is gathering pace with each passing day. Big corporations and car manufacturers are going electric and ditching the combustion engine. The Biden administration is pushing Americans to transition to electrical vehicles. We think they are coming in a big way. This is a technology of the future. Electric car sales are on the rise in the U.S. Tesla is coming out with an all-new electric vehicle. EVs represented at least 10% of all new passenger car sales. And while most people might think this to be yet another business trend. What they don't realize is that just like oil determined the power of nations in the 20th century, in the 21st century, whoever controls the resources to build an electric vehicle or solar panel will go on to control the world itself. And just like oil, this is one such industry where both business and geopolitics come hand in hand. So while on one side Tesla, Ford, and Volkswagen are pouring in billions of dollars to crack the EV market, on the other side China and the United States are in a geopolitical war to dominate the most essential materials to build an electric vehicle. China's growth in EVs is what some experts call a Chinese storm in the global industry. Foreign automakers, including American brands, are now paying attention to Chinese players like BYD. The U.S. has to become more competitive to grab a bigger electric vehicle market share. India's electric Electric vehicle market is expected to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 90% this decade. Similarly, in India, we are seeing giant companies like Ola Electric, Athol Energy, TVS, Tata's, and even Hero pushing their boundaries to capture the EV industry of India. And lastly, just like any other business revolution, even the EV revolution has some wonderful opportunities to invest and build a business in. So in this in-depth episode of 30 minutes, we are going to take you into a deep dive and give you a snapshot of the entire EV industry. And this is the only 30-minute explainer that you would require to understand the macro view of the electric revolution. So let's dive into the case study and understand why are US, China, and India so crazy about EVs? Where does the power game of electric vehicles actually lie? How will EVs determine the next superpowers of the 21st century? Where does India stand in this race? How are legends like Ambani and Tata catapulting India into the EV revolution? How is the economics of EV changing with each passing year? And most importantly, as entrepreneurs and students of business, where do the golden opportunities of electric revolution lie? This video is brought to you by the One Percent Club, which is founded by my dear friend Sharan Hegde, and you might know him as Finance with Sharan. While most people only know Sharan as a content creator, I know Sharan as the super hardworking person who has been working relentlessly to spread financial education in India. And with this vision, he started his company called the One Percent Club, which now has Nikhil Kamath as an investor. The vision of One Percent Club is to help you achieve financial independence, which is the superpower to never work for money again. You see, the Indian education system only focuses on helping you get a high-paying job. But what good is that high-paying job if you don't know how to manage and use that money to grow your wealth? In fact, many famous people like Amitabh Bachchan and Michael Jackson have almost gone broke after earning hundreds of crores. This is how dangerous financial mismanagement is. So, if you don't want to make the mistake of neglecting your finances right from your 20s, if you're serious about taking control of your hard-earned money, and most importantly, if you want to learn about early retirement planning, tax planning, and insurance planning, use the link in the description to join the One Percent Club and become a part of this wonderful finance community. And now, on to the episode. Chalo, let's start from the basics and first try to understand why are we suddenly moving to EV from IC engines? And there are three straightforward reasons for this. The first reason is climate change because our carbon emissions are at their peak, so much so that emissions during World War II look healthy as compared to the emissions today. So the ice caps are melting, temperatures are going to extreme levels, and it's causing a havoc all across the world. There is a troubling indicator about global warming. Preliminary data shows the Earth has breached a critical temperature threshold. For the first time in recorded history, well, emissions continue to rise. With those rising emissions, heat is going up too. The massive ice sheets at the top and bottom of our planet are shrinking much faster than previously thought. Secondly, fossil fuels are depleting so fast that at the current rate, we have less than 100 years of fuel left. 
we might be running out of our main energy source. It is speculated that the oil and gas reserves we have right now will barely last us another half a century before we run out. And lastly, we have the vulnerability of Indian economy to oil prices. Now, I don't have to tell you much about it because you already saw how the Russia-Ukraine war caused the oil price to hike and how it affected the Indian economy. So these are the reasons why India and every other country have set their zero emission targets. And these targets lie between 2050 to 2070. Global oil prices have touched $116 per barrel mark. This is the highest in the eight years. Now, if you look at when does a revolution actually become successful, you will see that it is a combination of three variables customer desirability, market viability, and technological feasibility. And when a product or service falls at the cusp of these variables, it results into a successful product and ends up bringing a revolution. So let's dig deep into the EV revolution and see how these variables actually come together and you will understand where this revolution will peak better. Now, if you look at this chart, you will see the entire value chain of the EV industry along with their EBITDA margins. And this chart says that there are six emerging value chain entities on which you could build your business in the EV industry. The first segment is the battery cell manufacturing and packaging and BMS. Each of them have an EBITDA margin of 15 to 20% and 20% each. For those who don't know, Battery cell is the basic unit of a battery, which consists of an anode and a cathode. So the battery cell is the smallest unit in a battery system that can store and release electrical energy through chemical reactions. Whereas if you look at a battery pack, a battery pack is an assembly of multiple battery cells. So these cells are connected in a pack to increase the voltage and the capacity of the battery. So these battery packs are the energy storage system of an EV. And lastly, a BMS or battery management system is like the brain of the battery. So the BMS manages the performance, health and the charging and discharging of the battery to make it last longer. And BMS is super important because it safeguards the battery from overcharging, overheating and other factors that could impact the safety of the battery. Basically, BMS is like the CPU of batteries. If this is very, very clear to you, let's come to the second segment, which is the segment of EV components. Here, there are businesses that specialize in manufacturing various parts that make up an electric vehicle. And this includes everything from motors to inverters, which contribute to the overall performance and efficiency of the EV. Then we have the third segment, which are software and telematics, which again have an EBITDA margin of 15 to 20%. So just like your phone has a sophisticated software, even EVs are run by software and electronic control units to manage the battery management, motor control and user interface. This software is crucial for the efficient and safe operation of vehicles. And this means as we move towards EV and as more and more cars get connected to the internet, we would see a huge surge in in-car applications. And here's where again you have a massive opportunity. Then you have the new age OEMs or original equipment manufacturers. And here's where you have an EBITDA of 8 to 10% and you have companies like Ather Energy which produce, design, engineer and assemble EVs. And then the fifth segment is for the charging ecosystem which again has an EBITDA margin of 8 to 10%. And lastly, you have companies in the mobility as a service segment which includes companies like Zip Electric, Blue Smart and Yulu. This is what the ecosystem of EV looks like and their EBITDA margins look like. If this is very very clear to you, let's dig deeper. Now, if you look at the hero product in this entire value chain, what's your answer? What is that one product that this entire value chain revolves around? Well, if you haven't guessed it already, it is the battery of the EVs. So just like the entire IC vehicle industry is dependent on the supply chain of crude oil, the EV industry is dependent on batteries. The transition from fossil fuels to sustainable electric power has gone mainstream, most visibly in the auto industry. Those cars and trucks run on lithium batteries. Now, if you look at the cost factor, batteries make up 35 to 50% of the cost of EVs. So they are not just functionally important, but they're also economically important. And you know what, guys, this is where you'll find something absolutely shocking because here's where the geopolitics comes into play. So the question is, what is so special inside these goddamn batteries and how does geopolitics come into this matter? Well, if you crack open the battery cell of an EV, you'll realize that there is an anode, there is a cathode, and both of them are separated by an electrolyte, and all of this is covered by the body of the battery. And if you go even further and break down cathode and see what exactly it is made of, you will see that it's typically made up of four important components, which are lithium, cobalt, manganese, and nickel. And cathode alone makes up 51% of the total cost of the battery. So it's by far the most expensive component in the battery. 
And then we have the anode, which is usually made from graphite and makes up 12% of the total cost. Electrolyte makes up 4% and separator makes up 7% of the total battery cost. So let's dive into the hero product of the battery now, which is the cathode, because this is where the drama lies. So what are the four elements that make up the cathode? It's lithium, cobalt, manganese and nickel. And amongst these four elements, lithium and cobalt are the most important elements of all. But if you look at where these materials are found, you will see the secret to the next geopolitical battle. The global electric vehicle market is heating up and China wants to dominate. We are building the future of the electric vehicle. The US is expected to add 1 million new EVs to its roads in 2023. The electric car fleet is growing rapidly and the necessary infrastructure is expanding in Russia's Moscow. If you look at this graph, you will see that 96%, I repeat, 96% of the entire world's lithium comes from only four countries, which are Australia, Chile, China, and Argentina. Chile's lithium industry has taken center stage. Chile has the world's largest reserves of lithium. China has become the world's largest lithium processor, controlling 55% of the market. We're really lucky in Australia. We have the most amazing natural endowment of all of these battery minerals. In fact, when it comes to world rankings, we're in the top 10 for all of them. So just like oil mines define the richest and the most powerful countries in the Middle East, today, these lithium mines are like the oil mines of the 1940s. So does it mean that Australia and Argentina will go on to become super rich and super powerful countries? Well, not really, because here's where I found something absolutely mind-boggling in this chart. In this chart, you will see that even though Australia is the biggest lithium producing country in the world, they for some strange reason did not sell this lithium to the world directly. What they did instead was export this lithium to China and they shipped more than 90% of their lithium exports only to China. So Australia is not selling lithium to the world, it is actually China. Now, isn't this stupid? It's like saying Saudi Arabia is selling oil to the US and the US is selling oil to the world, right? Well, this is where I started digging even deeper and that's when I found another chart. This chart explains how exactly is lithium extracted and then sold in the market. And as it turns out, lithium cannot be sold directly and it has to be first processed and then be sold and then it needs to be recycled to be sold again. And if you look at how China dominates each one of these value chain segments, you will be shocked. Look at this map. Four countries that have maximum lithium reserves are Australia, Chile, Argentina and Bolivia. And in 2013, China acquired a 51% stake in the world's biggest hard rock lithium mine in Western Australia. And a Chinese company is the second largest shareholder in a Chilean mining company called SQM. And China's Gafeng Lithium Co. controls 51% of an Argentinian lithium project and they also have heavily invested in Bolivian lithium reserves. So who controls the supply of lithium? It is China. Bolivia, which is home to huge reserves of lithium, has chosen a consortium involving a Chinese battery firm to develop plants for extracting and also processing the metal. Deposits that are worth over $1 trillion eyeing these reserves now is China. Argentina is home to huge reserves of lithium used in electric batteries. Chile has one of the world's three largest reserves of lithium and is second only to Australia in terms of total production. Australia is the biggest producer of lithium in the world. Then we come to the refining capabilities. And as it turns out, Australia does not have refining capabilities at all because all these processes require very huge capital infrastructure and high-tech machines to actually master. And China controls 60% of the global lithium refining capabilities. Similarly, as of 2022, China also produced 75% of all lithium and batteries in the world. This is because they have these mega factories that manufacture these lithium batteries at scale. And today, out of 200 lithium and batteries, 148 of these mega factories are present only in China. Whereas if you look at Europe and North America, they barely have 21 and 11 mega factories each and India has zero. So who's controlling the production of lithium? It is again China. And here's where one of my team members asked me a very interesting question. He said, bro, China is producing lithium. That's great, no? Because we can just buy it once and keep on recycling it. Because lithium is not like oil, where after using it, the product will get extinguished, right? So why don't we just let China take all the burden of establishing the supply chain and we can just focus on recycling? Makes sense, right? But guess what? Again, more than 66% of the current recycling capacity in the world only lies with China. So long story short, China clearly dominates the lithium and EV battery value chain from top to bottom. 
Now the question is, China is controlling the lithium value chain, that is fine. But what if we could take control of cobalt? Because China does not have a lot of cobalt reserves. So what if we strangle China using cobalt? Well, this is where even I started studying cobalt. And again, I found something absolutely astounding and disturbing at the same time. You see, cobalt is the second most important element for an EV. And if you look at this chart, more than 72% of the entire world's cobalt is produced by a country called DR Congo. And even the next 10 countries combined do not produce cobalt to match DR Congo. But you know what guys, you will be shocked to know that China is already so heavily invested into the most valuable cobalt mines in DR Congo that out of the total 19 cobalt operations, China either owns or co-owns 15 of these operations. Which is why, if you look at who does DR Congo sell this cobalt to, it is again China. Now the interesting question over here is, why only lithium and cobalt? Why the hell can't we just use some other material to build these EVs? Well, this is because lithium and cobalt have some magical properties. When it comes to lithium, lithium has three magical properties. Firstly, if you have ever looked at the periodic table, after hydrogen and helium, lithium is the lightest metal of all. In fact, it's the lightest metal which is available in solid state because helium and hydrogen are usually in gaseous state. Secondly, it has an energy efficiency of 95%. And lastly, lithium can hold a lot of energy as compared to its weight. So while a typical lead acid battery stores 30 to 50 watts of energy per kilogram, a lithium ion battery stores 150 to 250 watt hours per kilogram. So a lithium battery can hold three to eight times more energy as compared to a lead acid battery of the same weight. And just like lithium, even cobalt has three magical properties. Firstly, it is a complementary material to lithium because cobalt enhances the energy density of lithium ion batteries. Secondly, it improves the longevity and stability of these batteries. So batteries with cobalt can often be charged, discharged one to 2000 times before their capacity actually starts degrading. And lastly, cobalt enhances the safety of these batteries. So it prevents these batteries from catching fire. So long story short, cobalt and lithium are irreplaceable and China controls the access to both these resources. If this is very, very clear to you, let's dive into the most important question of the episode, which is the India story. Sarkar, electric vehicle ke kharidaro ko kai tarah ke incentive de rahe Income tax mein chhoot se lekar loan ko aasan banane jaise kai kadam uthaye gaye hain. GST is only 5% on the electric vehicle. As compared with petroleum vehicle, it is coming to 48%. So the question is, where do we stand in this EV revolution and with China having so much leverage, can companies like Tata, Reliance, Ola Electric and Ather Energy actually make a difference? And where exactly is the EV revolution of India heading? Well, firstly, we don't have a choice, guys. We have to go electric because we need to meet our emission targets. Otherwise, if you remember from our geopolitical episodes, there could be carbon tax applied on our products, which will make our products costly in the global markets. So the question is, do we have lithium reserves? No, we have potential reserves, but we do not have proven reserves yet. And even if we find lithium, we do not have the capacity to process them. This is the reason why India is importing 100% of its lithium products worth 170 crores and 8,800 crores worth of lithium ion batteries from other countries with 70% of our lithium battery dependence only on China, which is risky. But when it comes to other parts of the value chain, there are a lot of companies in India which are trying to capitalize on the entire EV value chain. And I'll attach a list of all these companies in the description along with their segments so that you can develop a better understanding of the sector and the companies involved in that particular segment. And this brings us to the heart of the electric revolution of India, which is the electric vehicle market. So the question is, where do we stand in terms of the feasibility of EVs? People, for this, you need to understand the viability cycle of EVs in India. If you look at this diagram, you will see that when EVs were started to be made in India, there was very less demand for EVs. This is the reason why electric vehicle companies could not achieve economies of scale. Plus, the cost of batteries was also very high during that time. This is the reason why very few people could afford EVs, which led to less demand and hence EVs were very costly in India. So this is the vicious cycle of market viability where it becomes impossible to drive adoption. But this is where the godfather of the market comes in. Now, who is the godfather in the market? It is none other than the government of India. This is where the government comes out with subsidies to turn this viability cycle into a virtuous cycle from a vicious cycle. And this is where we have subsidies like Fame 1 and Fame 2, which not just subsidize the consumers, but also subsidize the companies so that they can decrease the cost of their production. So what does the government do? The government comes and says, listen guys, we will decrease the cost of EVs by giving people subsidies on the purchase of the EVs. At the same time, we will not tax the EV companies and give them discount on land costs and import duties. 
This way, the companies will be able to decrease the cost of their vehicles and on top of this cost drop, customers will further get a discount with these subsidies. Eventually, the cost of EVs will decrease. And this is where the cycle changes. When the cost of EV decreases, there is more demand for EVs. Due to high demand for EVs, companies are able to mass produce vehicles which decreases their cost further. And this results into more cost drop resulting into more demand leading to more cost efficiency. So with the time, if you look at this graph, the cost of batteries has also decreased. So suddenly the same vicious cycle turns into a virtuous cycle due to government subsidies and the research and development that goes into decreasing the cost of components. And when the cost drops enough to make EVs affordable, the government withdraws these subsidies in phases so that free market can sustain itself and then the government can collect taxes. This is how the godfather can create a market and boost the growth of an industry. And if you look at the result of these subsidies, it has been absolutely magical. This is where you need to understand something called the total cost of ownership or TCO of EVs and IC engine vehicles. Total cost of ownership is nothing but the total cost of owning and operating a vehicle over its lifetime. So it combines everything from purchase cost to fueling and charging to maintenance to even insurance and financing. Now, if you look at this graph, you will see that the highest cost variable for an EV is the purchase cost, whereas the highest cost variable for IC engines is actually fuel cost. So if you see this chart in the TCO of EV two wheelers, the cost of purchase is 1.51 lakh rupees, whereas the charging cost is just 13,420 rupees. But for IC engine vehicles, while the cost of purchase is only 64,000, the cost of fuel over time comes to 1 lakh 38,000 rupees. So do you see, if you just combine the cost of fuel and the purchase cost of the vehicle, EVs are actually way more economical as compared to IC engines. It's just that the initial cost of purchase is very high. And if you look at this chart, this is not just the case with two wheelers, but even with three wheelers and even trucks. While an IC model of Honda Activa has a total cost of ownership of 2.32 lakh rupees with subsidy, an Athor 450X would cost only 1.87 lakhs. And even without subsidy, it would only cost 2.35 lakh rupees, which is just 3,000 rupees more than the Honda Activa. And if you go down the chart, it's even more astounding. For a three-wheeler cargo vehicle, while a Bajaj Maxima's total cost of ownership is 10.66 lakhs, an Euler high-load EV costs only 6.33 lakhs with subsidy and just 8.07 lakhs without subsidy. And lastly, the most amazing comparison is this comparison between Tata Ace Gold and Tata Ace EV. Because as you all know, Tata Ace is super important for the small business owners of India. And here, as you can see, the TCO difference between them is 15 lakh rupees with subsidy and 12 lakh rupees even without subsidy. And this is absolutely game changing. This is how the government uses subsidies to legitimize an industry in the market. So now the question is, if the cost of EV goes down, does it mean that EVs will very easily be adopted in the Indian market? Well, even I thought so. But as it turns out, while I was reading this report by Bloom Ventures, this report says that there are four cold start problems in India which need to be solved by entrepreneurs like you and me. And this is where you have a massive opportunity to either invest or start a business. So let's dive into the last segment of the episode, which is called the cold start problem of India. The first cold start problem is the lack of enough brands in the EV sector, which to a large extent is being solved by all the companies that are there in this chart. This basically says that we need more EV brands in the market. The second COSA problem is the state of components in India, which is being solved by government policies and subsidies. And if you want to get into component manufacturing, I will attach the PLI details in the description. The third cold start problem is the state of charging in India, where we need an aggregator platform to plot all these charges and make it accessible to Indian customers. And we would need a lot of public charging stations. And lastly, like we saw in the TCO chart, since the cost of purchase of EV is too high, there is and will be a very high demand for financing options from NBFCs like Bajaj Finance or banks like IDFC First Bank. This is the story of the EV revolution of India. So we learned about the value chain, the margins, the superpowers, the geopolitics, the India story and the cold start problems of India with respect to the EV industry. And I just hope you understood and learned something valuable from this case study. That's all from my side for today, guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button and auto make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.